I just spent two weeks with the 16 inch MacBook Pro and it has been a completely different experience than what I expected. And I also ran into one issue that I really hope Apple can fix with a Mac OS update. When it comes down to it, I watched the Apple event, I saw the specs and all the claims that Apple made, and then I immediately bought 14 and 16 M1 Pro base models with 16 gigs of unified memory because I knew that for most of the people who are interested in this type of laptop, those would work great. At the same time, I also wanted to see what fully specced out M1 Max versions of both can do, and those just got in the studio. But today is all about my experience with the 16 inch M1 Pro with a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU, and 16 gigabytes of unified memory. And I gotta tell you, I think this might be my favorite laptop. Now I don't normally start out by talking about the display, but this one is spectacular. It's the nicest display that I've ever used on a laptop and it has actually caused a problem for me. You see, I knew that I was gonna get a 16.2 inch liquid retina XDR display and I had already been using the 12.9 inch M1 iPad Pro so I had a sense of the mini LED display quality. I also knew this was gonna be a ProMotion display and so we're getting Apple's adaptive refresh rate and the MacBook can either slow down that refresh rate down to 24 hertz to conserve battery life or it can bump it up all the way to 120 hertz when that higher refresh rate helps provide a more responsive and fluid user experience. So those things were already on my mind before I ever saw it. But the moment I opened it up to set up the MacBook, I had like an instant automatic smile on my face. Then I started using Photoshop and I was looking at thumbnails that I created on my main workstation and I totally did a double take. I mean, I know what my thumbnails look like. I sit there for hours staging and then editing them. And the first time I saw them on a 16 inch MacBook Pro, I realized that the displays on my main workstation suck. And this is gonna be a real problem for me because if I wanna replace them, I have to replace six of them. I just couldn't believe how much nicer the MacBook display is. And now my other displays look like something someone created with like a dot matrix printer. And I'm sorry for anyone who's under 40 who doesn't know what I'm talking about. Now back to the display, the colors are brilliant, they're accurate, and they have a good amount of saturation. The image is very sharp, and I love using it for photo editing, video editing, watching content, and for how big it is with the 3456 by 2234 resolution, it's also a great choice when I'm organizing my work. And speaking of that brings me to today's sponsor, Monday.com. Now if you've heard of it before but you weren't sure what it is, think of Monday.com as a super flexible platform that you can easily customize to help run different aspects of your work. So in my case, I can use it to manage everything I do for Tech Gear Talk. So anything from organizing ideas for future videos to actually scripting with Monday work docs, creating core courses and then even working with different companies, all from right within their platform. You can also use it for project management, marketing, sales, and CRM, and even something like software development. I spent 20 years developing software and I was blown away by how simple the user interface is. And I love the fact that they have templates for pretty much any type of user to help you get started in minutes. This way you don't have to start from scratch and at the same time you still have the flexibility to customize it for your needs. I'm also super impressed by automations and how much time they can save you. So all you need to do is set a trigger and an actions. For example, when a script is marked as done, move this video to the ready to shoot section. You can click the link in the description to check it out and get one free month. And again, thank you to monday.com for sponsoring this video. All right, so the display is fantastic. Let's talk about the rest of the experience, starting with the ports. And this includes the one problem that I ran into. So as far as the number of ports, I'm extremely happy with the 16 inch MacBook Pro. On the 13 inch M1 version, all we got was two Thunderbolt 3 ports and to make things worse, they were both on the left side. So not only were there not enough ports or enough types of ports, if I wanted to connect accessories or to charge it from the right, I had to wrap longer cables around to the other side, which can be a pain. On the 16 inch MacBook Pro, we're getting a total of three Thunderbolt 4 ports, one on the right and two on the left. So I can connect accessories from both sides. We also have an SD card slot and an HDMI port on the right, so I don't need to live that dongle life anymore. Now, I mentioned this in my initial comparison of the 14 and the 16 MacBook Pro, but even though this is an HDMI 2.0 and not a 2.1, for how I use this laptop, this hasn't yet been a real life limitation when attaching external displays. Now this is the M1 Pro model, so it supports up to two 60 hertz 6K displays. And the new model that I got here that's fully spec'd out with the M1 Max supports up to three 60 hertz 6K displays 
plus an additional 60 hertz 4K display. Now, whether I'm at my desk or on the couch or laying in bed, I can attach accessories and charge the MacBook Pro from both sides. And speaking of charging, I had a viewer reach out to me on Twitter to see if I can replicate a problem with the new MagSafe port, and I was able to. So first, on the left side, we've got a MagSafe 3 port, which I absolutely love. It's super fast, it detaches if the cable gets a sudden pull on it, it also means that I can charge the MacBook Pro without having to use one of the other ports. On the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro, you had to use one of the Thunderbolt 3 ports in order to charge it, then only left you with one, which is obviously not ideal for a Pro workflow. So this MagSafe port has worked great for me with one exception. If the display is closed and the MacBook is turned off and it's not fully charged, MagSafe seems to go into this infinite loop where it keeps playing the connection sound over and over. Now, I assume that this is something that Apple can take care of with a macOS update and I'll keep my eye out. And just to confirm, this was only happening on a 16 inch model with a 140 watt power adapter. When I did the same thing on the 14 inch model with the 67 watt adapter, I got a connection notice once and then it kept charging. Now, one of the things that I was worried about with this model was the size because I remember having a 17 inch laptop years ago and just having it feel so big and bulky that I never wanted to take it with me. So I'm not sure if I changed or if it's just a thinner form factor of this laptop, but I did not mind throwing this in my backpack and taking it with me. Maybe it actually comes down to me liking this display so much that I'm willing to give up on some portability. When I really wanted to maximize my on-the-go productivity, I used a 12.9 inch M1 iPad Pro as a wireless display with sidecar. And this way I could have a dual display set up with me anywhere I went. And by the way, if you have a Mac and you have an iPad, you should 100% be using Sidecar. I have a video that shows you how everything works and I'll link to it in the description. When it comes to the typing and trackpad experience, this laptop is as good as it gets. Like I was worried about this large palm rest because even at the store, it just looked so much bigger than any other laptop that I own. But in practice, it's been great. I still love how much support there is for my arms, and now I notice the ergonomic difference when I go back to a smaller laptop. If you've watched any of my other MacBook videos, you know that I love this keyboard. The keys are very comfortable to type on, even after hours and hours of work, and this is still my favorite keyboard on any laptop that I've used. The trackpad is as accurate and as responsive as the one on the M1 and the 14-inch MacBooks, but this one is an absolute monster. Like, I don't know if you could see, but it's pretty much the size of my entire hand. And as a frame of reference, the iPhone 13 Pro easily fits inside it. I talked about this in my initial review and in my comparison with the 14-inch MacBook Pro, but the Touch ID button has been excellent. I really like the little divot in it, and it's been fast and accurate. I'm gonna say again that I still wish that we at least had Face ID for unlocking, especially with the size of this notch. And speaking of the notch, there's a temporary fix for apps that don't play well with this new notch. It will scale the entire display so that it fits below the notch, and it can be used with apps that haven't been updated to deal with the notch correctly. Now it's not the most elegant solution because it pretty much makes the bezels thicker all the way around, not just at the top, but it will work if you're in a bind. Now personally, none of the apps that I use have been impacted by it, especially on the 16 inch model, and I still don't have an issue with the notch as a concept if it means that I can get a larger usable display with a smaller form factor. And since we're speaking about the notch, the new 1080p camera is very good. It's much better than the one on the 13 inch MacBook Pro, and it will work great for video calls. Now onto the speakers, because over the last couple of weeks, I've continued to watch videos and movies, and the audio experience on this laptop is so good. The 13 inch MacBook Pro had the best speakers of any of my laptops. And then I listened to the 14 inch MacBook Pro and I was like, whoa, these are considerably better. And then I listened to the 16 inch and I was like, game over, shut it down. So I know it sounds like I'm fawning over this multimedia experience, but if you watch movies on your laptop, I'm telling you, don't test this at the store because it will ruin other laptops for you. When it comes to processing power, even with this base model with a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU, and 16 gigabytes of RAM, this is an absolute powerhouse. If you've watched this channel before, you know that my focus isn't on benchmarks. I use them because it's a way to standardize comparisons, but I'm much more interested in real life use. Well, this thing is borderline ridiculous. I was running multiple apps at the same time, so Photoshop, Lightroom, Final Cut, or Premiere Pro, then Chrome, which 
we know is gonna be a resource hog. And this thing was sitting there looking at me like, that all you got? I, I thought we were gonna get a workout in today. And even when I ran a stress test with it being pushed to 100% CPU usage for 30 minutes straight, the performance didn't drop and the fans were barely on. What was more interesting was the comparison of the 14 inch and the 16 inch running the same test because the way they managed the heat buildup wasn't the same. And if you haven't yet, I would highly recommend that you watch my comparison. I also wanna talk about the unified memory because I seem to have a different perspective than a lot of other people, but first let's talk about battery life. So battery life has been really good for me so far. It's hard to tell in everyday use if it's better than the 13 inch MacBook Pro. I know this this one is rated for 21 hours and the 13 inch is rated for 20 hours, but I feel like the 13 inch lasted longer. Now, this could be a case where I'm pushing this one harder because I know it's more capable, but I have some more detailed comparisons coming. Okay, so now let's get to the different configurations and what I think about the unified memory. By the way, I'm using the Apple Store prices, but I have links in the description, which a lot of times have lower prices. The 16 inch MacBook Pro starts out with a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU, 16 gigabytes of unified memory, and 512 gigs of internal storage for $24.99. You can upgrade to 32 gigabytes of unified memory for 400 bucks, then all the way up to eight terabytes of internal storage for an additional $24.99, which is kind of bananas. And of course, remember that none of this can be done post-purchase. So what you buy now is what you'll have forever with this device. You can then upgrade the chip from the M1 Pro to the M1 Max with either a 24 core GPU for 200 bucks or a 30 core GPU for 400 bucks. But you'll notice that that actually increases the price by an additional 400 bucks because you're automatically upgraded to 32 gigs of unified memory. You can't upgrade to the M1 Max and only get 16 gigs of unified memory. Now, having said that, assuming that you're already getting enough internal storage, my next upgrade, if any, would be the unified memory. I know that with what we're using these laptops for right now, there may not be a meaningful difference between 16 and 32, but this chip is so absurdly powerful and this laptop should last you five to seven years or even longer. And since you can't add memory later on, I think it's not a bad idea to consider getting more than what you need right now especially if you're the type of user who's going to push this laptop, run a ton of demanding apps at the same time, and you want the best performance. I can't wait to start working on comparison between the base M1 Pro and the fully specced M1 Max. Now that you watch this two weeks, almost perfect review of the 16 inch MacBook Pro, you should watch this video right here. Click on my face to subscribe. Hopefully this video was helpful. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.